Thank you for the welcome. It's an honor and privilege to be here, and I mean that. I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that what I say will be spoken clearly about C.S. Lewis. I know, Lord, that Lewis would not want to be glorified here this afternoon. So I pray that what I speak about C.S. Lewis will point to you and ultimately bring glory to you because I know that it was your presence in him and your guidance that anointed his ministry of writing and teaching. Now, Lord, protect me from saying anything that might misguide or harm these whom you know and love and died for. I pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Well, let me tell you something about what I'm... My, the title of my talk is C.S. Lewis and the Care of Souls. That might sound like a rather strange talk in as much as Lewis is well known as a writer of fantasy, writer of popular theology, a first-rate apologetics man. But I'm convinced that this that this man is sometimes not recognized for the soul physician that he was. So I'll be talking about that. And the sources that I'm using, you can't see what I've documented my comments with, but if you should go to the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, in the western suburbs of Chicago, what you'll find there, the Marion E. Wade Center, is, is just a treasure trove of Lewis materials. And I talked to Marjorie Mead, who's the associate director there. I talked to her just the other day, and she knew I was coming. And she said, welcome everybody at the Desiring God Conference to come to Wheaton. She said, you don't have to be a scholar who's doing research. You don't have to be attached to Wheaton. Come and see the museum, see the things. But I'm drawing today upon virtually thousands of letters that C.S. Lewis wrote, as well as numerous oral history interviews that my wife and I did in the 1980s, from the mid-80s to the early 90s. We interviewed many, many people that knew C.S. Lewis well personally. So a lot of what I'm saying today, I've drawn from letters that he wrote to people over the years. We heard today that there, uh, Warney Lewis, his brother, estimated that there were 12,000 letters. A letter people, I'm not letters, there were 12,000 people he wrote to, and to some of those people he wrote numerous letters. Well, I want to begin by pointing out that, as you know, C.S. Lewis's range of influence is enormous. It's very wide-ranging. His influence is really nothing short of phenomenal. He published over 30 books when he was alive, and when he died, in the years in the wake of his death, people like Walter Hooper began to find his things and bring it together, and more and more books came out. In fact, J.R.R. Tolkien, one of Lewis's close friends, says, Jack's the only man I know that wrote more books after he died than he did when he was alive, because they just kept coming out, and they still do. But the question I want to raise here is, how do we account for his enormous range of influence? Because today, Lewis's books sell much more widely than they did when he was alive. His books are in nearly 50 different languages. They've been translated into many languages. And there have been movies made about what he wrote, two movies made about his relationship with his wife, Joy Davidman. There have been stage drama presentations. His his, his influence is enormously wide. So how do we account for this? You say, well, it's simple. Lewis had a brilliant mind. He was a genius. Yes, he was. He had the best education money could buy in the English-speaking world. He attended Oxford. He'd been tutored by one of the best minds in all of the United Kingdom. He had friends who were brilliant and iron sharpens iron. But we could go on and on with those assets, and you know, quite a few people in the world have had those things. 
First-rate minds, well-disciplined and demanding academic environments. Friends who are very intelligent and encourage one another. There's got to be something more. And the first thesis I want to present in what I'm saying this afternoon is this. I believe that C.S. Lewis's influence was wide when he's alive and it's growing ever wider today because his relationship with Jesus Christ was so deep. Wide range, depth of relationship. I had a seminary professor years ago who gave me one of the best pieces of advice I think anybody could ever give us someone, whether you're preparing for ministry or doing something else. He said, Dorset, never worry about the breadth of your influence. He said, everything in the culture will have you worrying about that. He said, you focus on the depth of your relationship with Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will take care of the breadth the way he wants it to be. I believe that was Lewis. I believe Lewis instinctively knew that. Lewis's depth of ministry must be seen in the context of his commitment to growing spiritually. Just a few weeks before he died, an American named Sherwood Wirt contacted Lewis and asked him a question. Listen to this. What is your view of the daily discipline of the Christian life? The need for taking time to be alone with God. He went on to say, in essence, he said, a lot of Americans are saying that daily devotions, to be in prayer, to read Scripture, is a, is a yoke of legalism. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. What do you think, Mr. Lewis? What do you think? And here's Lewis's response. Listen to this. He's, of course, referencing Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6 is his authority. He said, why, we have our New Testament regimental orders. I would take it for granted that everyone who becomes a Christian would undertake this practice. It is enjoined on us by our Lord Jesus Christ. And since they are His commands, I believe in following them. It is always just possible that Jesus Christ meant what He said when He, said, when he told us to go seek the secret place and close the door. That's the fresh side of Lewis, isn't it, that just never grows old. Well, Lewis certainly worked on the depth of his ministry by reading Scripture. My wife and I had the privilege of discovering a large portion of C.S. Lewis's library that had been sold off after he died, and it had been preserved, bought by an institution, and they couldn't keep it. And we went and looked at it, and were able to, a donor gave us the money to have it purchased by the Mary and E. Wade Center. Among the things we learned, we learned what books he read a lot of. Some of them he'd put marginal notes in and written in the end papers. But we also found among his things Bibles that he had worn out, virtually worn them out. He'd wear out Bibles in English and he'd wear them out in Greek because he could read and write Greek, even Koine Greek, as easily as he could English which was his language, of course. So he was a student of Scripture. He also, as an Anglican, employed the English Book of Common Prayer for daily devotion. So beyond just his own regular Bible reading, among the things that happens if you use the lectionary in the Book of Common Prayer, that you read through the whole Book of Psalms every month. So he's in the Psalms of School of Prayer every month, as well as all of his other Bible reading. Beyond that, Lewis was a man devoted to prayer. When I wrote the book, Seeking the Secret Place on His Spiritual Formation, I was absolutely astounded at his balanced prayer life. I learned from very, I don't have time to talk about all this, but he, he got up early in the morning and got alone with the Lord and prayed. And then when term was on at Oxford, he'd go to Dean's Prayers, which was morning prayer in the Anglican tradition at Magdalen College at the university. He also was involved in corporate prayer frequently, not only in those morning prayer sessions, but he was a churchman. He was committed to the local church. 
In fact, he said in more than one place when people said, well, I, you know, I have a relationship with Jesus, but I don't think this going to church is all that important. Lewis said the New Testament knows nothing of individualized Christianity. You're called to be part of the body of Christ and to give what talent and gift you have to serve the brothers and sisters and then let them serve you with what they have. So he's into scripture, he's into prayer, and he not only prayed a lot, he was... He prayed for people all over the world. He's very Pauline in this sense. As you read Paul's epistles, you know Paul's got a prayer network. He's praying for the Ephesians here, the Thessalonians there, the Colossians, the Philippians. But he's also soliciting prayer for himself because he knew he needed it. Lewis did the same thing. He's corresponding with people in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, as far out as India, all over the United Kingdom. And he'd say, I'm praying this for you. I'm praying that for you. Would you pray for me? Please pray for me. So he's got a prayer network going on. Lewis also, beginning in 1940, approximately a decade after he'd become a believer, began to go weekly, almost every week on Fridays, to an Anglican monk named Father Walter Adams. And this man became his spiritual director. A lot of people don't like that phrase. I said, director, that's bad news. It's a mentor. It was somebody that was discipling him, if you will. And among the things he got from Father Walter Adams was Lewis learned the importance of confession. Not that he had to confess to a priest. He knew he didn't have to do that. Scripture said if you confess your sins to God, if you confess, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But Adams taught him, you need to go to a safe place where nobody's going to talk about it. Confess the sins that you're committing. Confess the temptations you're wrestling with. And then be held accountable when you come back next week or you're getting this done. Have you restored that? Have you ceased from doing this? So that began to strengthen the depth of his relationship with the Lord. Adams also taught him something else, and this is really important. He began to teach him that Jesus Christ wants a deeply intimate personal relationship with you. And that can only happen through the precious Holy Spirit. So you need to be open. You need to seek intimacy with the Lord. And begin to talk to him in prayer as if he's sitting right there with you because he is. Well, I say these things and I lay them out quickly. This is because this is so important. I don't think without this, Lewis could possibly have had the impact he had and have it grow the way it is now uh, uh, because of all the spiritual realities involved. The scriptures tell us in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, you know this text, I'm sure most of you do. But, but I like to think of it this way, and I have a feeling that it even applies right here this afternoon. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the world, throughout the earth. The eyes of the Lord are ranging throughout the earth, seeking to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You see, in one level, Lewis wasn't that special a person. In many ways, he was no different than you and I. But he really was trying to be a man who said, Lord, use me. A hymn that he loved, one of Charles Wesley's hymns, one of the verses in the hymn, my gracious master and my God assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Lewis knew and you know this, that any man or woman who prays that from the bottom of their heart, God will answer that. He will use you in ways that maybe you'll never see, but he will use you to build his kingdom and bring glory to himself. And I want to add one more item here, and I could go on. One more item about Lewis's depth, and that is he became radically obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. He read the scriptures. It's like that piece I read. Why, we have our regimental orders about going to the secret place and praying. Why would anybody debate that? So Lewis would go through his New Testament, go through the Gospels, and see what's Jesus commanding? Among the things he commanded was that we share the Gospel. We have a great commission, after all. It's not the great suggestion. We have orders. 
And then Lewis learned with this deep intimacy with Jesus, and many of you know this, that sometimes when you're just alone with him, talking to him and praying, you sense that hand touching you, and there's a nudge to do something. Just a nudge. You know it's from God. It's not unbiblical, and it's, it's, it's like a call that brooks no refusal. And Lewis heard this. He told his friend Tolkien about it. I heard from Owen Barfield, who was Lewis's close friend. He said, one morning in prayer, I knew the Lord said to me, Jack, I want you to answer every piece of fan mail that comes to you. C.S. Lewis said, the doorway into the kingdom of God is obedience. So he set out to do that. And lest you think it was just a lot of legalism, it was not at all. He felt he had a call on his life. He had a call on his life to answer the mail. I, I found a letter that Lewis wrote to an American man, Mr. McLean, in 1945. And the letter begins, Lewis's letter to the men begins with this phrase, I always answer fan mail. And it's because of that why thousands of these letters exist. And in these letters, which have not written, Walter Hooper has edited a three big, three massive volumes of these letters. But there's more stuff that hasn't even been found yet. But what hasn't happened is these things haven't, most people aren't going to sit down and for bedside reading, read through three massive letters. Uh, volumes of letters, but there increasingly are little collections coming out on different areas where Lewis was a spiritual advisor and a soul physician to people. My friend Marjorie Mead at Wheaton, she and I back in the 1980s edited a little book of C.S. Lewis's letters to children. They're phenomenal letters. We were talking about that last night, Brian. Well, Lewis was committed to obeying the Lord in the large things and the small things. His letters, my second thesis is this. The first one being the depth of his ministry explains the breadth of it. But my second thesis is this. I think his writing ministry related to soul care will live on even longer than his fiction and apologetics. And I'm no futurist, I'm no prophet, but I can tell you this, I believe that those letters of spiritual care will live on for decades because they talk to the real conditions of real human beings. And I personally, I've photocopied some of these letters, I give them out to students, I give them out to men and women in my mentor groups, I give them out to people in our church when they, there's a letter there that will address a soul issue. You see, Lewis never thought of himself as a soul physician. He never thought of himself as a pastor. He never saw himself as a spiritual director. In fact, he didn't like to sit down one-to-one with people to do spiritual talk. But his letters, carefully written, sent to people to address the issues that they were wrestling with. I want to tell you about one stack of letters. I want to tell you a story about what happened in... 1985, my wife and I were in England and we were doing oral history interviews of people who knew Lewis. And we went to see a woman. I'm not going to tell you her name. Her name's been, they're in the published letters now and the the new editions have put her name on it. But I used a fictitious name in the book Seeking the Secret Place because I frankly wanted her anonymity protected. But Mary and I went to see her. I'll call her Grace. That wasn't her name. We went to see her, she opened her home to us, gave us tea and cake, and we had a long interview and we had a tape recorder getting things she had to say about her relationship with Lewis. And then she brings out a stack of letters this thick, a huge stack of letters. And she walks over and she hands me the stack of letters. She said, C.S. Lewis began writing to me in the 1930s when I washed out at Oxford University. I had to leave. I didn't make it. I didn't pass the exams. 
She said, I wrote to him, he began to write to me, and she said, I have letters that go down to the early 1960s. And here's this stack of letters, and they look like somebody's family Bible that they loved or their devotional reading that they used every day. Uh, It looked like some Anglican's prayer book that always used it. Maybe it was like somebody's copy of My Utmost for His Highest that they've used day after day, year after year. Incredibly carefully stacked up. And you looked at it and the paper, you could see where her fingers, the oil on her fingers, there was discoloration, how she had read these over and over again. And she hands them to me. And she said, you need to take these and have them in the collection because I want to honor the man that helped me so much. I looked at my wife and I looked at the letters. I said, Grace, I can't take your letters. They're too important to you. What I would like is permission to photocopy them. We'll go tomorrow and photocopy them with your permission. I'll give you the originals back. She wept. She wept in joy. Her generosity was, I'm going to give them to you. But her prayer must have been, Lord, help me. I don't want to give up these. They're so important to me. They were so important because what she said was this. Think on this for a moment. She said, I was going to take my life after I washed out at Oxford. I was on the brink of suicide. If Lewis hadn't cared to write from, to me and carefully write to me, I wouldn't have made it. She said, then I got married, and she said, my marriage was very difficult. She said, it never would have lasted if he hadn't patiently read my letters and carefully wrote back and gave me spiritual help on number one to how to get some healing so that I could be a more functional person in this marriage. She, in many ways, was a very wounded and troubled soul. She said, said, then I had a daughter who was extremely difficult. And she said, I don't think I could have survived raising her without having a, a nervous breakdown if Mr. Lewis hadn't cared enough for me to write and give me some guidance. And these letters, just that one collection, were so rich with materials that not only applied to grace, but applied to me, to others, in so many ways. A soul position. You see, and here's the other thing. Lewis sometimes said, man, he told Owen Barfield, he said, I don't know why God has me write all these letters. He called it the bane of his existence. He said, this is a burden that really gets oppressive. By the middle of the 1940s, he was because of uh, the, the serialization of the screw tape letters, which then came out as a book, the letters started pouring in. And they kept pouring in and pouring in. By, the, by 1945 or 46, he said he got dozens of letters each week that he had to sit down, and most of them he hand-wrote answers with pen and ink. Occasionally, as you might have heard in one of the sessions earlier today, occasionally his brother would take dictation and type a letter for him. But Jack would dictate it, and Jack would sign it. But by the time the Narnian Chronicles came out, Imagine this. Imagine getting 200 to 250 letters a week. He is busy in the academic world. He has demands as a professor. He has publishing obligations and things he wants to write. And then he's inundated with this mail that he feels he has to write. Imagine that. But he did. And that these letters were efficacious and extremely important is witnessed by the fact that they've survived. So many people save them, like this woman handing us this enormous stack and said, I can't tell you how God blessed me here. 
Mary and I went through these letters that night and then we photocopied them the next day. Some of the things were fascinating. This woman became a Christian because of letters Lewis wrote. She wasn't a believer when she washed out at Oxford. And then she'd ask him questions about the faith. And in one letter, we don't see what she wrote to him, but we can read between the lines. And she'd talk to us about it the next day. She'd fill in what she'd written about. She said, Lewis said to me, you're never going to get well until you get to know Jesus Christ. And you're never going to get to know Jesus Christ until you start reading those Gospels and listening to Jesus. And she told us, she said, I sent him back a letter after I'd read through the four Gospels and said, I don't like him. I'm listening. I don't like him. What kind of a guy is it that's invited to someone's house for dinner and then berates the host in front of his guests? She said, I find him abrasive. I don't like him. And she's got this letter that Lewis wrote back, and he said, Jesus is not on trial. You are. Your opinion of Jesus ultimately makes no difference in this world except to you. But his opinion of you is he's calling you to be his. But you're going to have to surrender your pride before you can enter into his kingdom and into this relationship. This is tough love. This is not what we call today seeker friendly. He's kicking people. Get moving here. She also one time violated one of his rules and the rule was that you don't come and see me personally unless I give you permission and I don't like to do one-to-one -one interviews on these things. I tutor students but I'm not doing soul doctor stuff. I'm not a counselor. Well, she showed up one afternoon with her daughter, and her daughter was an obstreperous, unruly little wretch, evidently. And she just raised Cain in the house and caused all kinds of problems. Grace told us when we were there, she said, I wrote back to Lewis and said to him, I'm so sorry that my daughter behaved so wretchedly. She said, however, I was oppressed as a child, and I don't want her, as a young girl growing up, thinking women have no right to say anything. I want her to be a leader, because I think she's very intelligent, so I don't want to discipline her. I'll oppress her. Lewis writes back a beautiful letter. He said, I have no doubt your daughter will be a leader someday. She's clearly very precocious. But nobody can learn to lead until they've learned to follow. And you're going to destroy her opportunity to be a leader because you've never taught her to obey and to follow. He said, you need to get this thing turned around. How many people would do that? How many people would even see it that way? Then at one point, the daughter was having what she called nervous problems. And she said, I'm going to send her to... First she went to a psychiatrist and then to a clinical psychologist. She asked Lewis what he thought. Lewis said, I think your daughter's nervousness is not that big a deal. He said, all kinds of young people have issues. I'd be very careful where I sent her and what I had done. He said, because psychiatry and psychoanalysis is like surgery on the soul. And he said, you better be certain who that surgeon is. And he said, the problem is, a lot of the psychiatrists and psychologists are not Christians. And if you don't have a Christian, you're going to have some surgery done on your daughter that could be very destructive. So you need to be very careful and very prayerful about what you do. Fascinating things that he'd take time to write about. To the daughter, he wrote letters, and sometimes he'd illustrate them to her. Lewis argued, and he, he said this in his sermon that was delivered in 1940 at uh, St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford. Uh, you, you've read it, I'm sure, The Weight of Glory. He said, and this is part of the genius of all these letters. He said, in God's economy, there are no ordinary people. Everybody is precious to the Lord. And he said, every soul you encounter one day 
that person will be so, if you could see what they're going to look like in glory, you'd be tempted to fall down and worship them. He said, or they're going to be so hideous in where they're going at the end of time that you would flee in utter horror. There are no ordinary people. Everybody is destined to one of these routes or the other. And we have a responsibility to do all we can to help people grow into that Christ-likeness, not into that evil likeness. So therefore, every piece of mail is important. A little child 12 years of age from America can write a letter and he'll take as much trouble answering that as he does to some man of power in parliament because there are no ordinary people. You see, you never know who you're talking to. You never know what God is doing in their lives, what's going on. There are no ordinary people, he said. Well, Lewis wrote letters not only to the woman I'm calling Grace. He wrote letters to thousands of people, inquirers, seekers after God, recent converts who wanted help in learning how to grow in grace, people that were in bondage to sin, others who were struggling with guilt for sins they'd committed, wrestling with temptations, people that were battling melancholia or spiritual depression, people who had fears in their lives that were enormous, and then people who were utterly afraid to die. Lewis wrote to all of them carefully and laid out carefully things he thought might help them. To one woman in the United States who wrote to him, and she wrote to him over the years, in fact, these letters have been preserved in a volume entitled Letters to an American Lady. She was a bit of a hypochondriac, I think, as you read between the lines. And she was always writing to Lewis and always seeking guidance on how to deal with this and that. Well, she had some serious problems where she was really suffering physically. And she wrote to Lewis and she said, the pain is almost unbearable, and furthermore, I'm afraid I'm going to die. So he writes back, as a good pastor would, speaking truth, he said, I'm so sorry about your physical pain. I too have suffered pain at times, it's awful. And I promise to be in prayer for you and ask the great physician to heal you. He said, but fear of dying? You've given your life to Christ. What do you have to fear? In fact, it might be an opportunity for you to shed this tent that is so burdensome and painful. You see, encourage here, but also positive encouragement on another line, not playing into her pity party but saying, wake up. It's so rich. He wouldn't dodge touch issues, all kinds of things. There was one man that wrote to him, and I'm almost, in fact, my wife said, be careful that you even mention this topic, but I think I should, given the culture we live in. A man wrote to him and said, do you think masturbation is sin? I've copied this letter and given it to hundreds of men. And Lewis said, well, we've come a long way from believing that it's going to cause all kinds of physical or mental problems. He said, but I'll tell you, there's a huge problem. And let me just summarize what he said in a very long letter. He said, the Lord is calling us to get outside of ourselves. In fact, the great sin, the sin of pride, is we want to get absorbed with ourselves. Always about us. And he said, the problem with this self-sexual stimulation is that the man, and he was writing to a man, the man gets himself in a phony world that doesn't exist, where he has a harem of women fawning over him, telling him how wonderful he is, and there's not one demand on him to offer anything. And he said, consequently, what's happened is this guy's getting himself in a prison of his own design. 
He's being imprisoned further into himself. He said, so the problem with this act is that it's driving you further into yourself. Jesus wants to get you out of yourself to become your true self in your relationship with him. I think it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And he took time to write about these things to people because he knew it was important and he cared. Lewis's letters as we go on, and, and I've, I've read through so many of them, and I'm not bragging about that. I was paid to do that for a number of years. Imagine getting paid to search for Lewis's letters and to, to read them and write about him. I mean, it was, it was a grand thing, I, something I was uh, very grateful for. But Lewis was effective in these letter writings, and he's still, they're still so, speak so loudly to us because he treated each person that wrote to him with dignity. As I said, no ordinary people. But he also was always an encourager. Despite the tough love and the Jeremiah Amos-like prophetic talk to people about things, ultimately, he's always building people up. He was an encourager. Third, and certainly related to it, Lewis was always hopeful. Regardless of who you were, how much bondage you were in, how many people you had messed up, Lewis had such a high view of Jesus Christ that he saw every broken person as hopeful. It wasn't that he was anthropocentric and said, oh, you can do it, you know, a little self-help, let's have the right kind, go and cheer on. He said, Jesus Christ will never ask you to do something that he won't help you do. Jesus Christ's spirit's alive. He'll come into you, and if he calls you to, to break out of this bondage, if he calls you to do this, like answer the mail or whatever it is, he said, he will help you do it. He said, this is what the apostle Paul meant when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't have to, it was not prosperity theology. It was a Christ-centered gospel message. He also was very helpful in his letters because he was honest about himself. He would point to some of the garbage cans in his life. He didn't take the lid off and take everything out for everybody to look at. But he was willing to say, when somebody wrote and said, oh, I'm battling temptation, it's just overwhelming me. He said, I know, I know all about that. And by the way, I want to tell you, if you slip and fall, one of his letters on this is beautiful. If you slip and fall, don't panic. Get up and walk home. He said, we're like little children coming home from school. We slip and fall into the mud. We're covered with dirt. We arrive at the house, and the loving mother is there to meet us at the door. Come on in. The hot bath is drawn. Clean clothes are laid out for you. A towel is in the drying cupboard. Let's get cleaned up and get on with the evening. What a beautiful image. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These letters are replete with these things. He didn't say, gee, I can't imagine anybody doing that or I can't imagine this and that. But always he pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He always pointed to Christ. Let me read to you something. I want to read to you a, a couple of letters here, just pieces from a couple of letters. One woman in the United States in New Jersey wrote and said, we have a reading group and we read your things. I'm, you can tell by what Lewis writes that that's what they're doing. And he wrote a lot of letters to her over the years. And she says, uh, she was a very well-meaning person, and she thought she was encouraging C.S. Lewis by reporting that her friends are reading his works and attempting to emulate him. And that letter elicited this response. He said, sister, I am shocked to hear that your friends are thinking of following me. I wanted them to follow Jesus Christ. They'll get over this confusion, I think. <laughs> In the same spirit of encouraging people to 
look at Jesus and stay focused on him. One of the last letters Lewis wrote before he died was to a little girl in the United States. We don't know what she asked, but he wrote a tender letter to this little girl, and he's a very sick man at this point. He said, if you continue to love Jesus Christ, nothing much can go wrong with you, and I hope you may always do so. Isn't that precious? I tell you, he had raging fever, he had a terrible infection, and he's still doing that. About 25 years after C.S. Lewis died, I talked to a few of his friends and acquaintances doing oral history interviews and asked them if they were aware that Lewis felt burdened by all the letters he had to write, and they all agreed he did. Clyde Kilby, who directed the C.S. Lewis collection at Wheaton when it, and founded it, said one of Lewis's acquaintances and an early student talked to him and helped him see, he said, there's no shred of evidence on Lewis's part that he thought his letters might eventually be published. He had no sense that they would take their place on shelves beside his other books. But as he wrote to an English girl in the late 1940s, he said to her, the important part of spiritual life is keeping on doing what Jesus requires even when you don't understand why. Lewis didn't understand why he had to write all that mail, but he knew he was supposed to, and he did it. The letter that he wrote to, to a little girl, he was godfather to this little girl, and she happened to be in the Anglican tradition, and she was going to be confirmed and have her first communion on a given Sunday, and she wrote and asked him if he would come to her first communion. And he was not able to go because he had to take care of this woman who became a surrogate mother to him, Mrs. Moore, and he said, I can't get away and come down to London on Sunday. He said, but I'm going to do two things that a godfather does, he said, and it was obvious what he meant. He sent some money. He said, your mother will show you what to do with this. And then he said this, when you take your first communion, and you already know this is an important thing. See, in that tradition, it, it, it wasn't just memorial. It was you really meet Christ. As Lewis said in letters to Malcolm, he said, holy communion is like a hand from a hidden country reaching out and touching you. Christ's presence is there. So he said, when you go to receive your first communion and you take the elements, he said, you might expect to feel something. And he said, maybe God will grant you that. And should that happen, thank him, praise him and thank him. But he said, you might not feel anything. And if you don't, that's okay. That's his will for you right now. He said, but the important thing is that you keep taking communion regularly because Jesus commanded it. He said, do it as often as you do it. Do it in remembrance of me. Do it often. And then he concluded this portion of the letter with these words. He said, after I surrendered to Christ and went back into the church and became a communicating member of the Anglican church again, that means he started receiving communion again. He said, I don't think I felt anything for five years, maybe longer. He said, I didn't feel anything. I was just going through the motions. But he said, I went forward in faith. He said, but now I look back and I realize that because I obeyed him, he was strengthening my soul and transforming me to be a little bit more in his likeness. How many people would take that kind of time to write to a little girl? You say, well, that was his goddaughter. Yes, but he wrote the same kinds of things to other people. To end my talk now, and I'm down to less than a minute, Lewis's writings will live on for a long time because of the depth of his relationship with Jesus. He attempted to practice what he preached. He answered the mail despite 
his inability to see wider purposes. Faithfulness in the most mundane things, offering up small things as a few letters each day, afforded him an opportunity, I think, to give over his meager loaves and fishes to Jesus Christ, like that little boy in the Gospels. But unlike the lad with the bits of of food, Jack Lewis did not live to see the Lord multiply his gifts. But gifts they were. Nevertheless, these small offerings to each soul who wrote to him was multiplied into some of his most important books. With posthumous publication of many letters, among them letters to an American lady, letters to children, C.S. Lewis's letters to Don Giovanni Calabria, a volume that Paul Ford brought together called Yours, Jack, and more eclectic collections edited by Warren Lewis and Walter Hooper. A growing public throughout the world in nearly 50 languages now have access to some of Lewis's most important spiritual counsel. And for many of us, certainly for me, C.S. Lewis continues to be a soul physician to me and to many people I'm around. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for calling C.S. Lewis. Thank you for giving him the strength to your spirit to obey something you ask him to do that he saw no reason for. Lord, I thank you that as your inspired scriptures say, those who honor you, you will also honor. So Lord, bless these sisters and brothers here. I thank you for their attendance. I pray, Lord, that some of the things that we've learned from Lewis would draw us a little closer to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.